Welcome, everybody, back to yet another uh, episode of The Seditionists. I am Rob Furman, here with my esteemed colleague and uh, best buddy here, Keith Reeves, down in Virginia. And uh, today we want to talk about uh, education in terms of what we've been seeing recently in the news with uh, the, the, the movement towards charter schools, private schools, um, and all those type of all the other versions of school as opposed to public schools. And um, you know, as we've been thinking about this, uh, you know, right or wrong, I mean, obviously Keith and I both are very much vehemently against the idea of, of all these options because why don't we put our, put our efforts into one? But here, here's what I'm thinking, and, and I don't want to offend people, but at the same token, I think there's a time where we have to look into ourselves and say, why is this happening and what can we do to make changes? Um, you know, when you think about the coal industry, the steel industry, the car industry, you know, you hear a lot about all of these jobs being shipped overseas um, and finding better or alternate ways of dealing with that so they're not dealing with the American versions of those businesses. Um, and a lot of that comes to, at least from my minimal understanding of it, is that a lot of it seems to come to the fact that um, our, our unions have created a very expensive venture for them to deal with those or with, with those companies. At least that's in part. Um, my curiosity is and my concern is, as educators, are we going down that same road as those other uh industrial revolution industries because by going to a charter school or a private school or a cyber school, isn't it very similar to shipping those other companies overseas? They're shipping us out somewhere else. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure if it's because that they feel, I, I, there's no research that says they do it better. So Correct. are they doing it cheaper or are they doing it uh, is somebody else making a, pro a better profit on it than with us. So what is the reason that we feel like we may be going down that same road as the United States industries that have been shipped overseas? Keith, help us out. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's important to underscore uh, uh, one of the things that Rob said, um, and uh, as is always the case, and Rob and I both said this repeatedly over the course of the couple of years we've been doing this particular series, if you don't believe us, look it up, right? There is no substantive data of any kind anywhere that says that school choice privatization charters vouchers work. None. Sorry. They just came out with a massive new set of data just this week that yet again says, sorry, Betsy DeVos, your methods don't work. OK, I had a really interesting conversation the other day. Um, I was uh, out getting dinner um, and went to one of my usual haunts and somebody said, hey, there's this person that never, you know, doesn't mean anybody doesn't come here very often. And I made a pithy comment that unfortunately gave away one of my sociopolitical perspectives and, and a debate ensued. Let's put it that way. Um, but this person was uh, from the upper Midwest, from DeVos country, and was like, oh, her name's on everything. She's a big patron of the arts. I really like her. I think she's going to do a good job. And I said, based on what? Well, it was based on lay opinion, based on the fact that she seems to be an altruist. But we got into a discussion about the thing that I'm going to say now, which is why I think um, there is an attitude amongst a segment of non-educators that believes that we should go in the direction that you described and create a way to make things less expensive and more effective. And, and in the same breath, I'm gonna answer why it doesn't work. Okay, here's the deal. Whether you're into like big basic Adam Smith macro or you're you know, a fan of Ludwig von Mies, anywhere you fall on the spectrum of Friedman, whatever, economics, Capitalist economics is always driven by rational self-interest, so they say, right, and is based on a couple of basic underlying economic principles that one of the core most is being supply and demand, okay? In order for supply and demand to work, right, and understanding that they're cash and money, it's, it's a third commodity, right, that serves as an intermediary. I have goats, you have eggs, I want eggs, I have goats. Yes, we could barter, but money was invented to serve as a third commodity. In order for the supply demand to work, whether you're talking about direct barter or you're talking about utilizing a third commodity, you have to have an objective valuation of a standard commodity. You and I, to trade goats and eggs, have to agree what goats and eggs are worth, 
right? There has to be a consensus within the economy of Rob and Keith. If we blow this up to scale, which is what all these economic folks are talking about and business-minded folks are talking about, you got to include that third commodity, cash, like there's a dollar value. A dollar means what a dollar means at any given time. You can translate it into the yen or whatever. You can translate it into the peso or the euro. But everybody on the planet at any given time knows exactly what a dollar is worth. It means one thing. It's an objective valuation of a standard commodity. And that's the cornerstone of supply and demand. That condition doesn't exist in teaching. And therefore, market forces cannot work, which is why they've never worked. When you're talking about the thing in business of any kind in, in free market e economics, you're talking about a transaction that involves basically a dollar. It could be a goat or a euro, but it's, let's just call it a dollar. It's a standard objective commodity. If that's the center thing in economic theories, what's the center thing in teaching and learning, in education? Nobody can answer that question. Even if we say something like student achievement or skill mastery, it is never an objective valuation of standardized anything. It's always subjective valuation of non-standardized individual things. And therefore, the whole economic thing just goes tumbling away and it doesn't work. The insistent idea that we can somehow use economic forces and we can go down the direction of let's get cheaper labor so we can affect that one variable, it's all stupid because it fails to conceive the basic functional underpinnings of any system of education. So that's, I think that's why they want that is they think they can apply the same rules as I'm going to get cheaper labor in Mexico. And I must say, in addition to the fact that those economic theories don't apply, there's a non-monetary cost when you strip mined the Rust Belt and left families with no form of income simply to increase the bottom line for a corporation. You strip mined that community and took all their jobs out and put them overseas someplace or put them in a different community to lower the labor cost. There was a non-monetary impact in the quality of life of those families and a long-term economic impact that we're still not recovered from. I mean, you're in Pennsylvania. I grew up in upstate New York. We have seen cities leveled by the selfishness of I'm going to increase my bottom line, especially when they were promised retraining. So the, the same people that want to do that in education are the people that applied those things pell-mell writ large to different sectors that impacted the Rust Belt. And look what happened. Do we want that for schools? I think not. And, and, I, and I completely agree. And that's, that's where I see our, call it the fear factor. Um, Everything you say, I completely agree with, and everything you say, and maybe we're maybe I'm barking up the whole illogical tree here again because sometimes we get to the point where like we look at each other and we go, well, yeah, duh, but how do you stop this horrible boulder from running downhill? I mean, again, I think we've talked about it before: the idea of this greed destroying our country, and and that's what it feels like once again. So how do we? Stop this. It's not, so, so we've established that it's not about the money from an educational point of view, even though you and I, I think, would agree that whoever is pushing behind this is trying to make money off of the educational system. Absolutely. Yeah, just like the jail system, the privatization of jails. We used to yep. want to get people out of jail. Now That's we right. want to keep them in jail because they make more money when the people are in jail. So, you got it. I mean, are we going to do the same thing in education where we're going to want to keep them in education as long as possible because that's more money? As soon keep as them you, in substandard as as, education, yeah. Yeah, as soon as, you, as soon as you worry about making a dollar on the lives of our children, we are screwed. And that's and that's where <laughs> and that's yeah. where my fear really comes in because like like you you said it so much better than I did. You know, being from Pittsburgh, we've seen our steel industry get decimated. We've seen our coal industry get decimated. Detroit, the cars. You know, we've seen this, and you know the whole idea of learning from history. Obviously, that doesn't that doesn't apply to government because it seems almost ridiculously common sense that, that we are going down a very slippery slope. Not to mention the fact that 
here's the other part that blows my mind. Let's take money completely off the table. Okay, let's take money out of it and just say everything's equal in terms of cash value and what and how much people get paid and whatnot. Where's the magic bullet? Are are, are these are these school choice cyber charters da 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 da? Are all of these? Do they have some magic bullet that's going to educate these kids better than we can as public educators? And if they do have it, why aren't they sharing it? Because right. What is a parent going to get if they take the money and they say, I'm going to send my kid here instead? Are they going to get better teachers? I don't think so. Um, they'll get teachers that are probably paid less, but I don't think the quality is going to go one direction or another. If anything, it may lower, but I won't even go there. You know, yep. whatever. Let's just say that's equal. Are they going to get a better building? Probably not. Maybe equal. So all everything everything aside, it seems like wherever they're going to go, they're not going to get any magic bullet, but yet they're trying to make it sound like that's going to happen. Right. So what are your thoughts on that? I think that it's ideological reinforcement. I think that the thing that people pay for when they say, I don't want some public educator, which, and, and, and I think that it's fair to say that you and I, we don't have jobs, we have callings, we have a life work, we have... We, we have vocation, I guess, would, uh, it was a term I heard used recently. That's what we do is it's not a religion, but it's like a spiritual thing, you know, like and, I, and you and I could be making a lot more money doing something else. That's not who cares about that. There's critical work that must be done. And it must be done by people who genuinely, authentically love children, who want to dedicate their lives to bettering their craft and the craft of others, and to reaching, impacting, and bettering things for every single kid. Not just the kids we have, every kid. Uh, parents who say, I don't want you telling me what to do, what I think is best for my kid, and I know my kid best in X, Y, and Z. You can get people who will line up and say, oh, yes, you're absolutely right if you go to one of those environments. You can get ideologically reinforced that you're the world's greatest parent and everything you're doing is sacrosanct and you already know everything you need to do to be a terrific parent at some of these institutions. Now, I'm not suggesting everybody does that. I know that there are, I, I'll give you a prime example. Terry Lowry is a good friend of mine. She's one of the four horsemen of educational technology because um, we leave chaos in her wake everywhere we go. Um, she opts to send her child to a private school, not because she doesn't believe in public education, but because the public education that she has available in her jurisdiction, at least in her opinion, isn't to where it needs to be to specifically meet the needs of her child. And she has a great passionate love for her child, so she's going to do the right thing for her child. It's one thing to say it's an intermediary that fills in, and then she actually does listen to quality educational professionals. I think she would could be concerned about some of the circumstances in a, in a non-public setting as well. Um, but there are some people that, that believe in school choice, which as I've said a hundred times is just Republican code or conservative code for privatization. People want that because they get their ideological needs met when every bit of meaningful research shows that it will not improve student outcomes and help your child then you know you have to fly in the face of that to make that decision there are certainly jurisdictions where the public schools are so bad that parents feel like they have no choice and i would not want anybody to take this as denigrating a parent who makes a choice like terry and says i have to send my kid where they're going to get the best education and there really is a demonstrably better education at the school right next door but the solution to the actual problem is not more band-aids it's to correct the underlying wound, which is the chronic underfunding, under support, and mismanagement of the proper place to get that education, which is the freely available public school. And couldn't have said it better. I think you hit a really good point there, and I'm going to say it one more time because I think it's really critical to hear, is we're not saying the idea of choosing a better school for your child is a bad thing. I right. mean, again, just like we talk about personalized learning, if there's a system that's better for your child, then by all means, we would want you to go that way. Look at religious schools. Many people want that added uh, influence of, of, of religion in their schools. That's wonderful. I would never fault anybody for that, and I think that that's great that those opportunities exist. It's, it's more, I guess, when, 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 when this school choice thing does become common, as a parent, you need to maybe make the decision, am I doing this for what's better for my child, 
Or am I doing this because I want people to placate me and make me feel like I'm a better parent? Because those are two very different decisions. Yes, they are. Yeah, they're, they're two very different ideas. So, you know, obviously there are, there are opportunities, just like in personalized learning, there's going to be this personalization where maybe a kid will do better in a cyber environment. Uh, who am I to say? But what I'm saying is you've got to make the right decisions using the right data and the right understanding and realize that research out there is saying that there shouldn't be and there really won't be any academic difference. But if that's for your child, hey, you know, who, who are we to say otherwise? But you've got to be making the good decision for, for, for the right reasons. And mm -hmm. that's where I feel like some of this is getting watered down a bit because um, if parents are using this option to go somewhere else because they think that there's um, a light at the end of that tunnel, I, I don't think that that's really a true statement, especially based on the data and the facts that, that we're reading and that we're seeing. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, we can separate, of course, you know, Rob and I are professional pedagogues, so we don't expect that everybody comes from the same background that we do, um, but we're not invested. We don't serve a master um, in the way that some other sectors might, right? We're beholden to children only. Um, when structures, even within the uh, the public state run public education system um, run contrary to that well, Rob and I have established ourselves as, as insurgent voices that's why we are seditionist we speak up and say no this is not acceptable here's the research and is it a harder fight yes is it sometimes an actual fight uh -huh. <laughs> does it sometimes personally cost the two of us uh -huh. But what are you going to do? Not do the right thing? Like, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm just not built that way. Um, in the case of um, working with kids, we can separate in our minds what is good for the individual child, taken with all of the available data and information about that individual child, and still look at the aggregated data and make informed policy craft decisions. Yes, it is true that, you know, little David going to a private school might be a better choice for him during the 2017-2018 school year in this particular jurisdiction in Western Virginia. But that anecdote, no parent out there should say, well, this worked for my child, therefore it works for every child in every situation. That nonsensical homogenization cannot be the background of policy craft. Policy craft is rooted in the analysis of the entirety of the data, just like we're going to look at the one kid, but it's a different set of data and it leads to different conclusions. You can say it's good for this one kid and still look at the totality of data which shows that it is not going to make things better, it is not going to close the achievement gap, it is not going to substantively raise outcomes, it is not not going to help children meet their uh, needs better. It is not going to improve the fact that most kids find most school irrelevant. It isn't going to fix any of those problems. And pretending that it does takes away time, money, energy, and resources, as well as shifts public perception away from the real solution, which is the type of revolutionized school that Rob and I write, talk about, and try to build every day. Amen, brother. That was fabulously said, wonderfully said. Um, <laughs> so, uh, parents, educators, people that are listening to this, I've got I've got a homework assignment for you. Um, you've just heard us talk for I can tell you, 18 minutes and 14 seconds. I have a little clock over here, <laughs> and 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 I want you now to take what we said, think about it in detail, try to get rid of the the emotional factor of things because sometimes you can look into sort of close down on us because you just don't want to hear what we have to say. Uh, yeah. If we're right, wrong, or indifferent, it just doesn't matter. It's not your way of thinking, period. And I want you to give us an objection, and, 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 and obje uh, I'm saying this correct, I want objection. you to give us an honest answer to this question. If you are sending your kids somewhere else, what is your reason? And it can't just be something simple like because he wants to or because it's better, because I don't think so. I want you to give me a detailed reason as to why, because then it would be very interesting for Keith and I to say, okay, well, you know, there are parents out there that are making good decisions for this thing. Or there are some that we're, we're going to look at you and go, yeah, you're, son, you're sort of the person that's doing it for you as the parent as opposed to the benefit of the child. But I'm really curious to see what your answers are. Because, yes, we know if we, I know some people that have gone to other schools, private parochial, yep. cyber, cyber charters. And the ones that I talk to, I would say 
a majority of them have their head on straight and are making good decisions because of the needs of the child. But there are also those ones that are just, I don't get it. So, so help us, help us get it, help us understand. Um, so I, I would love to hear what you have to say. You can comment down below. Uh, all of mine and Keith's information is down there as well. Email us, call us, we're certainly not shy. We'll be more than happy to respond and talk and interact with you. Let's learn from each other. Uh, Keith, you wanna wrap us up, buddy? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not an economist. Um, I've, I've talked to economists about this subject. If anybody out there wants to have a conversation, if you can identify the single objective valued commodity, and don't tell me that a child is a commodity, I will come at y'all. Um, but if you can identify that, I'd be happy to listen to you. It, and remember, we do want to hear about this individual child. What are the decisions you're making for your children? Separate again in your mind the difference between talking about your child and all children. And if you think that what the decision you're making for your child should apply to absolutely everybody, you've got a lot of variables to account for. That having been said, a lot of you are way smarter than I am, and I would look forward to reading your comments. So thanks very much. I love conversations like this. Hope to talk to you again. Rob, as always, it's been a pleasure.